Okay, sorry, uh, I'll, I'll say it again. Doing the problem of estimating a covariance matrix, or more generally, estimating a matrix C that's been corrupted by multiplicative noise. So I have the thing, W is some uh, noise matrix. You can think of it as a white Wishart, which it is in the case of for the sample covariance matrix. But more generally, it can be any multiplicative uh, rotation invariant noise. Uh, it's easy to normalize it, so it has uh, mean one. Okay, and then I argue that if you don't if you don't have a prior on your matrix C, if you don't have a, a, a if, if you don't have a prior on the eigenvectors of, of C, if your prior on C is rotation invariant, then you'll fall, your estimator has to be in the class of rotationally invariant estimators and a rotationally invariant estimator, since the only eigenvectors in the problems are those of the matrix E, it must be in the same basis. So if, if E is diagonal, so you diagonalize E, you get eigenvalues lambda K and eigenvectors VK, your estimator of C will be uh, in the same basis, but you can change a coefficient. So first miracle, you, you have a, a tremendous dim dimensional uh, reduction. You go from a, a estimating n square coefficient to estimating just n coefficient. And the other mir miracle is that you can all do that in the large n limit, but it's, the, the two miracles are related because initially you have sort of n square data and you're trying to estimate n square, uh, uh, the object of size n square. And that's very, very hard to do, to do a good job. Now I only want to estimate n coefficients. So there'll be, I still have a sort of a factor n that goes to infinity. So I can have a, a concentration uh, if, if you want to talk in a mathematical term, but, but you, you, I have things that will actually converge to the right answer. Um, uh, by the way, uh, the right, the, um, this is a hopeless problem. It, uh, it's impossible to, to, to recover C exactly. You'll, you'll just get the best estimate of C. C is, is I mean, it'd be extremely unlikely that C is in the basis of E. Okay, so, um, so, uh, so, on, uh, so in, in, well, in typic, typical, I mean, in every case, your, your estimator will, be, will not be a perfect, you, you, can't find, you, you can't have perfect estimation. The only case where you have perfect estimation is this, this parameter Q, which is also super important here, N over T. Well, Q, uh, go, if Q goes to zero, then, then you recover perfect estimation. Okay, but, but and, and but uh, I guess in the general case, I don't need to, I don't need this 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 this, uh, this concept of Q because I have a general noise, and what will matter is the S transform of this noise. Okay, so um, so now we know that the, the estimator is in this form. We can ask the question: What's the best we could do? So the best we could do is called the the oracle. So suppose I I'm looking for an estimator in this class, okay, but I actually know C. So okay, so. Uh, Kind of a strange question, but it's, it's, it's kind of gives you a bound on uh, how, how uh, if you if you stay in this class and you um, and um, then the best you could do is the estimator the best estimator of that class knowing C. Okay, so this is called the oracle. It's cheating, uh, but it's it's useful to compute. And if you and so the oracle would be. Um, what is the, uh, so uh, I would say, um, well, let me just write the equation. What I want, I want to minimize, I want the, uh, I want the argument over the psi k of psi k, vk, um, vk transpose minus c, and then I take maybe a, um, this is symmetric, I can take the trace of this. Okay, so if I, if I know the matrix C, then I'd like to fix the coefficient. So, so it's kind of a convoluted problem. I have some, some basis, which is not the basis of C, but it's the basis, I'm, uh, the basis I have. What are the best coefficients um, to, 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 to have the best estimator of C in the least square sense, okay? And it's fairly easy to, to, uh, to do. I'll just give you the answer. It's just that it's like K. So, and this is an orthonormal basis, okay? The VK uh, are norm, they're, 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 uh, they're, well, they're, they're normalized eigenvectors, so they're orthogonal and, um, and normalized. So in this case, I get that the, the coefficient are just VK transpose C VK, okay? So the intuition, uh, again here, I'm sort of using the language of finance. Um, C is kind of a, is a, a, a risk matrix, 
um, uh, that I'm trying to estimate, these are, uh, you can think of them as portfolios, they're, they're vectors of, um, of weights on, on stocks, and what's the best risk that you should uh, apply to each of these portfolio? Well, uh, in, in this case, it's kind of, it's, it's kind of pseudo, well, it is, a, it is the eigenvalue of the matrix uh, chi, and the, what eigenvalue you should use is the realized risk, the real risk of these portfolio. So if, if that, that finance analogy is something, um, if it helps anyway, but, but you can just do this in two line computation. Okay, so, um, so the question is, uh, can we estimate uh, something like this? So obviously to compute this, I need the knowledge of C. And so as I said, the, the, the um, um, there, there's a miracle that happens in the large n limit that you can actually achieve this without knowing C. Okay, so the, the and 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 if so, the, the, the argument is as follows: This is the best. So I'm stuck in this. I'm stuck with this class of estimator, and in this class of estimator, the best I can do is this. So if I can achieve this on average, then. I have the best of this class of estimator, and this class of estimator is the, the, the best I can do in this problem. So, and this shows that the, the estimator that we'll build is optimal. So, um, and, and the, but of course, I need to do this without the knowledge of, of the matrix C. Okay? But I, will you see, I'll, I'll be using these kind of properties, especially the, the, the one at the bottom, that um, where, um, well, actually, I'll specialize it to the problem that 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 I'm looking at. I'll be using the t-transform of E, so I'll be averaging over W, and I'll have okay, so I'll have something like this for for my problem where I have the free product of C and, and the noise matrix W. I'll um, I'll be using an expression like this, which relates to me. The, uh, this the, a matrix in the basis of E and a matrix in the basis of C. And from this, I can compute, I can have a relationship between the eigenvectors of E and the eigenvectors of C. And this will, and it's essentially, this is a sandwich between the eigenvectors of C and the, uh, so these are the eigenvectors of E and, uh, and the matrix C. So this is the kind of thing that I'm gonna to try to do. Just, um, Okay, so how do I do this? Well, remember, well, um, yeah. So remember the, the, the G matrix, uh, this is maybe more useful. I won't use this one, but remember, I, I said this many times that it's, it's a projector VK. Well, okay, let me, this is E. Okay, so, but it's true for any matrix. So, um, so the idea um, to try to get something like this, I would, I would, I would like to, uh, so to know psi of K, I just need to, uh, I would need to, 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 to take G, E, and Z, matrix C, take the trace. If I do this, I will have, yeah, this I can also write as trace of this is a this is a scalar. This is a number. You can write it as trace of v k transpose c v k, and then you can use the cyclical property of the trace. It's also the trace of c uh, v k v k transpose. Okay, so if I can take the trace of the matrix C with a projector on a, on an eigenvector, um, I have the quantities I want. And remember the the resolvent. Um, at this formula, the resolvent matrix as a projector on each eigenvector uh, with a pole at, uh, at, um, at the eigenvalue. Okay, so for the, but I, I want to be using the T matrix because for, for the product, the T matrix has, has, has this beautiful property. So for the T matrix is, is very similar. For T matrix, I have that it's equal. There's just an extra matrix here, which shows up here as sum over K of uh, lambda k, vk, 
VK transpose in the same pole, Z minus lambda K. Okay. So basically what I want, what I morally would like to do, which I could do in finite N. So at finite N, these objects have, have actual poles. Okay, so at finite n, what I re really wanted to do is trace of C T E of Z. And, and this would give me sum over K of lambda K, DK, VK transpose C. I take the trace, let me pull out the lambda K. And then I take a trace here, trace is linear. I can, and then Z minus lambda K. So this trace I'm interested in, I could just take the residue, so I can compute this function. Okay, I compute this function, and I take the residue at, uh, at so if I want psi k, or if I want psi 27, I just take the residue at the, the, the pole z minus lambda 27, and I, I will get uh, I will get this object that I want. Okay, now this 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 trick worked really well with outliers. Because it, with outliers, uh, you you had a pole, um, you had a, um, or or if you have a Dirac mass, you are, you you still have a pole in these functions. The problem here, when we do the continuous limit, is that these functions, uh, when there's a lot of eigenvalues, uh, they don't well. They, they, if you want, on the real axis, they stay they stay random, and near the real axis, they behave as uh, you, you, the, the all these random um, eigenvalues behave as a branch cut. So taking a residue at the branch cut won't work. Um, it, it, it doesn't make sense. But nevertheless, this is never this is the right object that I want to compute. So let me just call this object. Um, yeah, let me just call this H of Z. Okay. And, and, and really this, this quantity uh, here, I, I, I've, I've written it, this is psi k. So the, the quantity I'm interested in is psi k. So psi k is in this equation. So let me rewrite it. I'm just going to rewrite uh, above h of z. I said it, e it is equal. Uh, I'm not sure I can compute it, but it is, uh, it's, it's true at finite n, and it will be equal to lambda k psi k z minus lambda k okay so recall uh, so i have this t transform of the matrix e i trace it with the matrix c that i don't know but later in the computation i'll, I'll manage to get rid of the matrix c but so i can define this unknown function h of z and at finite hand it has this pole structure uh, it has the coefficients i want um uh, but the coefficients are residues of poles of uh, uh, for uh, and then lambda k's are the eigenvalues of e, okay. And but now I want to take the large n limit of this equation. And in the large n limit, if everything um, is nice and smooth, uh, these all go to continuous function. And uh, if if I'm evaluating this function not on the real axis but anywhere else in the complex plane, I claim that this will become integral from lambda minus to lambda plus the the um, uh, assuming that the spectrum of my matrix E in the continuum limit will have a, a density row of lambda. It could have poles as well, but uh, um, uh, Dirac masses, but let's assume it, it converges to a, um, to a nice density without Dirac masses. And, and this density is defined, is bounded, so it's defined between lambda minus and lambda plus. And then I have lambda uh, psi becomes a function of lambda z minus lambda d lambda okay so what i'm saying is that this sum in a continuous evaluate at a z that's outside the real axis converges to an object like this one and the the the, the object i'm trying to to get is psi of lambda so what is psi of lambda so initially i had a um uh my estimator was psi k vk vk but I can write it as psi of lambda k vk vk. So I'm also estimate. I'm also making assumption, which is justified, um, that um, that these coefficient converge to a smooth function of k 
and, uh, and k becomes a continuous in the index and instead of labeling it from uh, from zero to one uh, in in increasing order of eigenvalues it's it's easier to uh, to label it by the corresponding eigenvalue and okay so so psi of k i now write as psi of lambda k and i said psi of lambda k uh, behaves as a nice smooth function that i'm trying to estimate okay so this is this is why I'm saying that this lambda, of course, um, uh, lambda k becomes lambda. I have a sum over k, but I'm switching to an integral over lambda, so I need the density. Okay, and just remind, uh, just the parallel, which which you should all know, is g of z, for instance, which was sum over k, the, the classical Steele transform z minus lambda k. It converges to an integral rho of lambda, z minus lambda. Okay, so it's really the same type of, uh, of of continuum limit, and again, this is only true for an argument z elsewhere in the complex plane. Uh, on on the real axis, these are random functions with poles, and they they're violent, and they don't converge to anything nice. But as soon as I'm away from the real axis, these converge to nice functions. Yes. Yes, uh, yes, yes, yes. Where happened to my one over n? Uh, so here definitely there's a one over n. Here there's a one over n, and I lost a one over n somewhere. Uh, it's in the trace. Yes, here it's a. Okay, I'm sorry. This is a. Uh, yeah. So this was a tau. So let me put a trace. Yes, really, it was a tau. So this is a tau, and tau is really trace one over n. Okay. So h of z is tau of c t u z, okay? and then then I need a one over n here. Okay. So I'm almost done. Um, well, no, not not almost done, but by the way, uh, I always we when do we end? Okay, so. What can I erase? I'll start over here. Okay. Let me try and let me find. So, and then this basically, I'm going to use again a Plem, I've, I'm sorry, I never in the Plemelge formula. So you know the Plemelge formula for 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 G. Okay, is that once I have the continuous version of Z of, of G of Z, you should all know that pi times the imaginary part of G of lambda minus i epsilon when i take the limit of eta well, no, eta times goes to zero plus this equals uh, it's one over pi so it equals pi rho of lambda there's no pi here yeah. okay so so this um and this is not specific to the function rho i mean this is true for any such integral so in my case, I have, I have the, the, what's on the numerator is not rho, but rho times lambda times this function psi of lambda. So my claim is if I know this function h of z, I can recover so that the imaginary part of h of, of lambda minus i eta will converge uh, to pi rho of lambda times lambda times this function I'm interested in. Okay. Okay. So, um, so, so I have my function. I just need to, um, to compute this H and take the specific limit, look at H on the real axis. Cause, cause really, okay. Maybe just practically just uh, step back a little bit. What are we trying to do? Um, we have a, a sample covariance matrix E, and we know it's not a good estimate. Okay, so yeah, so 
I think it's a good point to pause, to pause anyway here to try to remember what are, we, what are we trying to achieve. We have a sample covariance matrix E, and we know that, for instance, its, it's eigenvalue distribution is too wide. Okay, so maybe the root true C is somewhere here. And, and so in a sense, we'll need to, to shrink the eigenvalues because we, we know from the direct problem that, uh, that the matrix E is wider, has a larger variance. Um, and, the, um, uh, and so, so what we'll like to do is build an estimator chi, which, which I, I write again as psi, of lambda k. So basically, I go from. So what I want to do is take the eigenvalues. So lambda k's are the eigenvalues of the matrix that I observed, and I want to modify them by a function. So I'm trying to find this function, the optimal function, to shrink the eigenvalues. So if you think of this function, this is as a function of lambda. Well, this function is really only defined from lambda minus to lambda plus. I really don't care what the function does outside. Actually, it's not true. It even tells you something. If, if you have a few outliers, this function can tell you how to treat also the outliers because this is really a theory of the bulk, but it also works. Uh, there's a work by Antti Knowles on the fact that, that this also works for outliers. Okay, but anyway, but anyway let, let's focus on the bulk. No, psi, psi is the replacement function. This is this is, is, is the continuous version of psi k. Okay. So what I want to say is that so if I don't do anything, if I don't clean my data, there there is the so this is the y equals x line. Okay. So this is not doing anything. Okay. So I so if you think psi of lambda, if I say if I say psi of lambda equals lambda, for instance, maybe I should write it this way, psi of lambda equals lambda is the I don't do anything function. I I, I say, this is equivalent to say my estimator is just a sample covariance matrix. Okay. But I, I know that the small eigenvalues are too small and the large eigenvalues are too big. And th that's one reason. And, and also the fact that I don't know precisely the eigenvector also forces you to do even more shrinkage. So in the end, what you'll end up doing is some thing where these guys, you definitely want to move up. These guys, you want to move down and you want to do something in the middle. Well, it's actually, it's actually monotonous. Okay, so you, the, your function you want is a function that, and, and actually, uh, yeah. So, so this, this is lambda and this is psi of lambda. So it's a function that shrinks Maybe I should use it in a different color, although I don't think the colors show very well on the screen. But so, so I have a function here. It might be like this. It might have a different shape depending on, on the noise. And okay, but I want to, it's a shrinkage function. It tells you, I see an eigenvalue lambda that's small, I give it a, a, a bigger value. And then I see a big one, I give her a smaller value. And I do this in a sort of monotonous uh, way. And typical eigenvalues are one. And so an eigenvalue one, I typically, uh, I might move it a little bit, but, but, but it, it, one is not exactly a fixed point, but it's an approximate fixed point of this problem. And so, okay, so this is the, so this is the function we're trying to get. And I argue that in the continuous limit under nice circumstance, it converges to a smooth function of lambda and it's actually monotonous. I'm, I'm not sure we've, yeah, I think we finally proved that it's monotonous, but, uh, but I, I, it intuitively it has to be monotonous. It would be very strange if, uh, if this function is not in, uh, monotonously increasing. So if I have a small eigenvalue, I do something with it, but I'll, I'll, okay. So this is how I build my estimator, okay? And this is the function here. So in, um, it's just, so I have a, this function of a complex variable h of z, so again, h of z is going to be the normalized trace of t e of z I'm c. So I haven't computed this function yet. By the way, it's very similar to the, the object that I encountered yesterday uh, in the, um, uh, to the, the, the phase retrieval problem. So the, there was a function that I didn't compute in the phase retrieval problem, it was also called h of z. But it was a slightly different version of this. But it, it's 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 again uh, the trace of some noisy matrix, and 
and, and um, the original matrix, except that in the other case, uh, the, with the Wishart matrix and the noise were sort of inverted. But anyway, so, so I haven't told you how to compute this, and I really hope I can do this in 15 minutes. Uh, but if I know this function, then I'm done because on the real axis, where there are, where there are eigenvalues, uh, this thing will have a branch cut. And I can look at the value of the branch cut, which is really this process of taking the imaginary part uh, very, very close to the real axis. The branch cut of this function will give me uh, my, this function chi of lambda times stuff that I know. I know pi and a row. row. This is the, the sample. The sample, uh, I can measure the sample density. So the sample density I know, I know pi, I know the, the, the lambdas themselves. And so I, uh, from this, the branch cut of this function h, I can estimate this function, uh, at least in, in, in theory. Uh, okay. And so, and this function, as I said, it's something, it's a, some sort of shrinkage function uh, that will take um, for, for, for noise, uh, definitely uh, it will be some sort of monotonic function of, uh, of lambda. Okay, okay. And, and there's some sort of limit. When there's no noise, you get the identity function. When there's infinite noise, you just get a flat. You can't estimate everything, anything. So, so the, the other extreme limit would be uh, psi always one. This would be like kind of the, the infinite noise limit. So the, the no noise limit, you get, you get psi equals lambda. The, the infinite noise, you get psi equals one. And for in, in, in normal case, you get something in between. OK, now, how do we estimate this? And this is where these formulas come in handy. Okay. Because you see, I need to compute uh, the normalized trace of a, a T operator, uh, a T matrix of a noisy matrix and trace with, with C. And if I look at this relation that I've specialized, so the expectation value over the noise of the, the, the T matrix that I'm interested in is related to the T, the T matrix of C. Okay, and the T matrix of C is super simple. It's, it's an object like this. It's C zeta identity minus C. Okay, so let, let's, let's, let's see what we can do with that. And then it's just a little, a, a bit of simple algebra to recover something useful. Let me see the clock is running. Uh, maybe I'll keep this. So what I claim is that I can take this expression, multiply, this is a matrix expression, but I can multiply by C on the left and on the right and take the, the normalized trace, okay? And so I get that my function H of Z will be given uh, by the normalized trace of C and then let me specialize exactly. Well, let me call this, this big object here, capital Z. So, so, and maybe I'll use a lowercase z or zeta. So, so capital Z will be what's in the, with the argument and the argument is, is, well, little z, S transform of the noise evaluated at the T transform of the sample covariance matrix uh, at the same point. Okay, so this, this is just this argument here that I, I give it a, a letter to, to be able to, to do the algebra more quickly. Okay. Go ahead. Yes. The trace of this uh, matrix C is always equal to one, yes? Yes, but yeah, it's a normalization convention. I don't, I don't actually need it. This is a mandatory condition? No, 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 no. It's just a, a, a clean way of normalizing things so that the typical eigenvalue is one and so on. If, if trace of C were seven, then the typical eigenvalue would be seven and, uh, and et cetera. It. Yeah, it's just a, a, a clean way. Maybe it doesn't cost anything to normalize in that way. And it's easier to, when I plot things that one is the value where, uh, where I expect uh, most eigenvalues to lie or the average eigenvalue, et cetera. Okay, so I just define this, this, this variable Z is, is the argument and then uh, and then I'll just write T of C is C 
uh, evaluated some uh, zeta is zeta identity minus c inverse. But here, it's in, I need this evaluated at this big Z. So I have C, another C. I'm not going to write C square because I'm, I'm going to expand this. Uh, and then uh, big Okay, so here it's just that I'm evaluating this. Uh, uh, yeah, I'm evaluating the, 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 the T matrix at this argument. Okay, this argument is a bit messy, so I'll just leave it here. Okay, and now I want to do some very simple algebra. I have C, I have two Cs, and basically what I would like to do is, is, um, is relate back to um uh, to another to to the original t transform so in the original t transform if you want uh the one thing that, that i also have this, this other expression that t of e um evaluated z is uh tc evaluated big z okay so if i can and and, and tc is really the normalized trace of C evaluated big Z. So what I'm trying to do is recover an expression like this, except that here I have two Cs, I have C squares. Okay, but instead of writing C squared, I write C times C. And you see that by adding and subtracting this identity matrix times Z, I can, um, I can use the, the, the fact that, that this is the inverse of, of what I will, I will, I will build something that will cancel this term. And so I actually, this way I'm gonna get rid of one of the C's, okay? So let me do this. So I'm saying that this is the same as tau of C, C plus, no, C minus big Z identity plus big Z identity. So I haven't really done anything. And then I, I have, uh, big Z identity minus C inverse, okay? So if I look at this term here, it's really the inverse of this term with a minus sign, okay? And this is just a constant uh, in, in, in the matrix sense, okay? So what, what I get, I get, well, I mean, tau of minus C Z identity minus C. And then I have this term here, which is the identity matrix that can pull out of the trace plus Z tau of C um, Z identity minus C inverse. Okay. Well, this is just the T transform of C evaluated in capital Z, and the T transform of C evaluated in capital Z is just the T transform of E evaluated in the normal Z. So this is just plus Z T E of, uh, of Z. Of, yeah, I, should put, I should put smaller Z's like this, so you don't, don't confuse them. So these are the capital, the capital Z's are this ugly beast, okay? And here, uh, The, the this this has disappeared sorry yeah this this here the the, the, the um, this is the inverse of that so it becomes the identity matrix okay. so i get minus tau of c plus minus because this is the, the minus the inverse of that okay so this is my matrix h my matrix h H of Z is very simple. So it has a term that depends on the trace of C, but actually I don't even care about this because this is real. This is real. And the only thing I really care about, I've erased it's here is imaginary part. So this doesn't even contribute to the imaginary part. Okay, so I have, a, and, then, and then I have the, the T transform, and you see, uh, boom, 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 boom. Yeah, miracle, it's gone. 
C is gone. Well, the, here, I, what's left is a trace of C, but, but it's real anyway, so I don't, I don't care. And I've, I've managed to express everything back into quantities that I could in principle observe. The T transform of the sample covariance matrix. And this object here, which has the S transform of the noise, but evaluated at the T transform of the sample covariance matrix. So uh, this is the, the, the sort of the, the large and uh, miracle that um, essentially because everything converges to limits that I can compute, I could actually compute this only using objects that, are, that depend on E. Okay, so if I put all the pieces together um, and then you're gonna have to trust me on some simple algebra with uh, imaginary parts and, and um, so basically what I need to do, I'm really interested in, in Xi. So Xi is really H, imaginary part of H divided by rho. Rho is itself, so rho lambda actually, rho lambda is the imaginary part of, of the T transform. So I can write it as a ratio of, of two imaginary parts. So this is what I'm gonna do. Uh, and then the factor of pi is canceled out. So I get psi of lambda will be equal to some ratio. Well, initially, let me put the limits, but actually I could, put, it could be the same limit. It's a ratio of two limits of imaginary part. So what do I have? I have the imaginary part of, uh, oh, I er erased it. But it was um, to, 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 what was it? Uh, let me use my notes because I don't want to say something silly. Yeah, it's so it's T of E evaluate at lambda minus I eta times S transform of the noise evaluate at the same T transform divided by. So it's a ratio of the imaginary part of the T transform, um, except that on the numerator, the T transform is multiplied by the S transform of the noise. So if the noise is one, if, if, if there's no noise, uh, it's, if, the, if, if, there, if there's no noise, the S transform of the noise is just the one. And then I get the ratio of something divided by something with the same thing. So, uh, and there was a lambda that, that disappeared. Um, what happened to my lambda? Anyway, um, that's strange. Yeah, there's a lambda in front that I somehow missed somewhere. Okay, so, so, uh, so if the noise is zero, then if, if there's no noise, no, multipl no multiplicative noise means multiplying by one, the S transform of the identity matrix is one. And so I get the ratio of two quantities exactly the same. So I get that the, the, uh, the, the shrinkage function is lambda itself, okay? Then I can do a few things that I I'm, I'm, don't have time to do, but I can specialize I can go back now, I say, okay, well, what really interests me were, sam were sample covariance matrices. So if I say the sample of, of the noise is one over one plus QT, then um, I can write explicit equations uh, that are a bit more explicit than this. And I promise that if C is an inverse with chart, Then actually you have explicit formulas for T E. Okay, so, so, so E becomes the, the product, the free product of Wishart and inverse Wishart that, that, uh, that all of this is very explicit and you can actually write the, the formula and you get, you get linear shrinkage. Okay, and what is linear shrinkage is you get something very simple. You get a psi of lambda is essentially alpha times the identity or maybe I'll write it as alpha times your matrix plus one minus alpha times the identity. 
and alpha is some sort of signal to noise ratio. I think alpha is um, uh, is p over p plus q. Okay, so the variance of the signal divided by the variance of the signal plus the variance of the noise. Okay, this is typical uh, shrinkage. Uh, Oh, yes, this is uh, so, okay. You can write it here as lambda. But this translates directly onto a matrix. So, which is the matrix chi is alpha plus one minus alpha identity. So, here is number one. Yeah. So, so, basically, you have a shrinkage function on the eigenvalues, but because it's a linear function of the eigenvalues, it's a linear function of the matrices themselves. So, this is the only, the only super simple case. Okay, and as I said, this is even true in finite dimension. This was done by statisticians, um, and in, in finite dimension, you can you 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 don't do you don't use this. You use a Bayesian approach, and the fact that C is an inverse Wishart, you say you put an inverse Wishart prior on the matrix, and um, and you get this formula. But in this context, what it means is that. Um, uh, so, but it, um, that 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 these formulas you do you do recover the Bayesian. What I want to say is that you do recover the Bayesian approach. You do see that this is a shrinkage, and a shrinkage is always a signal to noise parameter. Uh, so Q is the noise in the in 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 the sample covariance matrix. P is the amount of signal that you have in the original matrix. So this is kind of a signal to noise ratio. Um, and I haven't told you. Let me just say all the things I haven't told you. Uh, these are all continuous functions on branch cuts. And in real data, you have finite n and you have poles. And so I haven't told you how to deal with that. But, but the, the simple trick, one trick that works, it's not the best thing you could do, but, it, I, but it's, uh, it's the first thing you can do is to just take an imaginary part. And if you take the imaginary part that's not too big or not too small, so imaginary part of order one over root n, then you can apply this. So you, you, you compute these objects, not on the real axis, because on the real axis you have poles and you really want to look for branch cuts. And, but so, and in a way, in a way to, a way to but you can, you could just make, take this limit and not go to completely zero. You basically say, okay, I'm going to use eta equals one over square root of n and use these equation as is. And this is a pretty good answer. You can do better, but you need to work more and, and to play with data and, and I'm done. Sorry for being a bit late. Just before, uh, okay, one question. Isn't it a mixed up in, in the notation? I'm a bit confused for a, mm -hmm. a minute or two. Like you end up with HZ at the top, which is sum over K of lambda K, psi K, Z minus lambda K. Yes. This one, yeah. Yeah, and below you, the H of Z is the tau of T, E, times c yes but the, the lambda k's are the eigenvalues of um e of e of e okay this is row so this this is row of e ah, yeah, yeah, yeah okay then it's fine uh, and the, sorry, yeah i actually never use in this derivation i've never actually uh, give you a symbol for the eigenvalues of c like C appeared as a trace, C appears in the trace. I never actually use an eigenvalue decomposition. So nowhere in the computations do I need it to, to tell you what the eigenvectors or the eigenvalues of C is. There's another way to, to do this that Jean-Philippe Bouchot prefers because it's to define the overlap between the matrices. And, and then and it's even more intuitive in a sense. Um, but I, I find it's a bit cumbersome. Well, I find it more cumbersome. But he, pre he prefers this formulation, and then this is uh, this is the formulation I prefer. Um, uh, so so you can define, you can say that C as eigenvalues mu and eigenvectors u, and then you you ask yourself if you have a U L and a V K, what's the overlap? And you can define the overlap function, and the overlap function will depend on on uh, on on lambda and mu. The problem with that is the continuous limit. The continuous limit of that is a bit tricky, uh, and so you need to be a bit fuzzy about what you're. Uh, but I guess you can make it more rigorous. But I, I find that this is closer to, uh, to to being rigorous. It's very far from being rigorous, but 
is slightly closer to being rigorous than, than, than introducing this matrix of, of um, so basically it's a function of two parameters, lambda and mu. So it's a function of, and which tells you how is an eigenvector associated with lambda of E, what's the typical overlap with uh, 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 for an eigenvector of eigenvalue mu for the matrix C. And you can do the sole derivation by introducing this function, which is actually useful because this function can be used in other computations as well. This is what you do in, in your paper, actually, but in the book, you do that kind of derivation um, instead. I think we do both, yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah, we, we first introduced this, this big phi of, of mu and lambda, yeah. but I, then, then I think we go straight to this. Okay. So, All right. So, I don't want to eat too much time for the next speaker. Question? If not, then thank you very much. Thanks.